Student Dr. Nicole Smith is a fourth year medical student with dual degrees in bioethics. Um, they, are they are graduating in May and headed to Michigan where she matched in emergency medicine at the University of Michigan Metro Health. She received uh, her medical laboratory science degree uh, in undergrad in Southern Adventist University and a master's in biomedical science at Kansas City University. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to her. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for that introduction. So my thesis project uh, discusses the topic of palliative and hospice care discussions, particularly in the Hispanic patient demographics. And that's what we'll be looking into today. Uh, so the whole point of this thesis is to illustrate that the gaps that exist in this area of medicine, specifically discussions that center around end of life care, which includes palliative and hospice care, again, with this specific patient demographic, risk the compromise, uh, the potential compromise of the bioethical foundation of medicine. So uh, we'll be talking about the significance of this topic, how medical bioethics come into play, hospice and palliative care in themselves as specialties, how Hispanics uh, are integrated into these areas, barriers to the usage of palliative and hospice care, and then proposals for inter interventions, concluding with uh, discussions regarding all of this. So the significance of this topic stems from the ever increasing change in the population of the United States. First of all, with the increase of our geriatric population, those that are 65 years and older, it currently makes up 16% of our total population. And estimates um, based on census progressions are expecting uh, that this population by 2030 uh, will include all of the baby boomers because again, a population 65 years and greater. So it'll become a greater need for us to be addressing this older population, which will be in need of end of life care. Along with this, we also have diversification in the United States. Um, we are seeing increased numbers of minority uh, groups raising, particularly the Hispano, Latino, uh, Hispanic, Latino population, it is the second largest ethnic group and the largest minority group, comprising 18.5% of the US population, 16.6 .6 million individuals. Again, these two populations, which have their overlap, are significant enough that uh, portions of the United States of our population and thus the population that medicine is treating, that they cannot be ignored. And uh, again, these numbers are continuing to increase. So again, as a bioethical uh, student, we have to bring in um, that component. And when we look at the medical bioethics that form um, the, this, that are part of the foundation of medicine, we have four principal ones. First established by um, Beauchamp and Childress, autonomy, which we all know to be that agency, self-government, uh, your ability to take information, to be explained, uh, whatever topic, and then to be able to make your own decision based on the information that you receive. Justice, the equitable, uh, different from equal, distribution of benefits and burdens. Um, beneficence, respect of the person's decision, protecting them from harm, offering them a specific tangible good. Uh, again, securing their well-being and the non-maleficent obligation to refrain from intentionally causing harm. And the reason that I bring up these specific topics is because we want to make sure that as medical uh, participants of the medical field, we are adhering to these bioethical principles. And in this field of end of life care with this population, when we are not able to offer appropriate care, we can sometimes violate these principles. Um, additionally, those are the four main principles part of the theory of principalism, but we have additional principles that have been set up by other uh, families of thought, primarily the public health sector, 
with health maximization, proportionality, and efficiency. And essentially health maximization changes the focus from individual care to the care of a population. That's important for us as we're looking at a subgroup of a population, the Hispanic Latin American community. And then in regarding proportionality, again, in terms of the amount of individuals that make up our population, are we addressing them uh, appropriately? Like, are we devoting sufficient energy and resources to this population in the same way that they make us up, as well as efficiency? We wanna be able to be doing the most and the best with the resources that we have available. And this is also important because with uh, hospice and palliative care and end of life care, we're able to mitigate costs that inv in, are involved with like increased total hospital stays, increased treatments that are more costly um, versus being using hospice and palliative care. So now moving into those uh, two specialties, palliative care specifically, is the specialty that provides relief from pain and other symptoms. It's all about supporting quality of life. Um, it's very patient-centered, patient and family-centered to make sure that their needs and their desires are being addressed and met. It uh, is meant to start early in treatment of any uh, significant illness. And there's multiple ways in which it is uh, utilized and so there's eight domains of palliative care that are used as a framework in offering it you have structure and process of care physical aspects of care the psychological aspects of care social aspects of care spiritual aspects cultural aspects care of the imminently dying and then ethical and legal aspects and again when we discuss the Hispanic population, there's multiple things, there are multiples of these domains that are directly influenced by this, um, which is why this is an important topic for me. Uh, along with hospice, we then have, uh, I'm sorry, along with palliative care, we then have hospice, which is a subset of palliative medicine. Uh, it specifically focuses at end of life. So palliative care, we're dealing with a significant illness that's altering a patient's life and hospice then takes it to the next level where you're now progressing into termination uh, of life, that time period. And specifically it is acquired, that um, designation is acquired when you have a prognostication of six months or less to live. And it is a philosophy of care, not a specific place, which is important because a lot of people don't under, understand that difference. And it's also highly structured and monitored. And um, this is important because to be able to benefit from hospice, there are multiple steps that must go into your eligibility and your referral and then acceptance. So you have to be certified uh, by two physicians in terms of having a terminal illness. Again, and it has to be very specific with prognostication of six months or less. And that's a very difficult thing to be able to pinpoint. and we're not perfect and we all make mistakes and there's so many factors that can compound how long an individual has to life. So that can become very tricky. Um, along with that, then you also have to be able to offer not only hospice, but palliative care also to a patient. And those conversations and those discussions become pivotal. And again, being able to offer this because it's kind of like that limiting factor of this whole process of this whole equation. If you can't even explain it appropriately and in a way in which they will be amenable to receiving, then it's kind of a moot point. Moot point. Um, and then the patient has to, in their mind and in their experience, shift from a cure, a cure for cure versus caring for comfort. And then, uh, after all of these things are accomplished, then there has to be, again, in terms of legality, a formal statement signed both by those that are involved in the referral and the patient or their decision surrogate. So then just to kind of uh, better understand, you have palliative and care, the two different um, specialties, and they can be confused a lot because there are certain parts that overlap. So for both of them, you are trying to manage symptoms. You are trying to uh, 
execute the goals of care for the patient and you're trying to help them in advanced care planning. But then for palliative care, you can do this at any time of a, of a severe illness, a life-limiting illness. And it can include both curative or um, like comfort treatment therapies. And then for hospice, that changes because the goal is only comfort. And again, uh, it's not any time during the illness. It's in that process, in that time period of six months or less of life. And then again, no more curative treatments. You're not, sh you're not now shifting to comfort. And on the uh, left side of the screen, we see how there's like a tier level in terms of these, uh, those that are offering this care. And this is important because it helps to depict how pretty much anybody in medicine can be involved in this process. So you have the primary level, which are your primary physicians that are establishing these um, more significant in time relationships with the patient. So they're treating the illness, discovering the illness, and the hope is uh, being the first to introduce these two types of care. Then you have the secondary care, which becomes your now specialized team, where you, and it's interdisciplinary. So you have multiple people, social work, spiritual care, um, specialists in terms of the type of disease that is being treated um, or cared for, et cetera. And then you have tertiary, the tertiary, tertiary level, which involves academic medical centers. And so this is basically like preparation, um, research regarding all of, all of these specialties and all of this information, as well as education. And that education, uh, it even includes us learning about all of this to better prepare ourselves to become individuals that can then offer it. And, and not only that, it's medical students, residents, um, attending physicians that are undertaking continuing education throughout their career. So then we talked about that initial limiting factor being the discussion. When this type of care is introduced to a patient, and this is again pivotal because it's that limiting reagent reagent in the equation. And this again becomes extremely important in our patient demographic because there are so many factors that can hinder discussion when you're dealing with uh, a different culture, a different population, a different language. So um, you want to be able to speak to the patient in such a way that you can understand where their moral dogma is. And this is important because hospice, palliative care, Western medicine is largely Eurocentric. The preferences are very much individualistic versus a lot of these other um, cultures have preferences that are more collective. Uh, and and what that means is we're dealing with the good of a family versus just the individual. And so that then changes the way in which a practitioner will present this information because the decision, although always remains that patient, depending on who you're speaking to, will involve different family members or different uh, individuals that are important to that patient. Another thing that is extremely important is appropriate establishment of the relationship between the physician and the patient. You have to be able to develop trust. And if that trust is not there, uh, it's hard to be able to, in a way, um, not coerce, but try to persuade, because as physicians, we do have to give our expert opinion. And so trust is needed in that. Um, in addition to that, you, we need to be able to glean the true desires of the, pen, of the patient. So if we want to offer benefit, who determines what that benefit is? It should be the patient. And so you have to be able to communicate effectively to understand what they deem to be benefit. And so that last point, beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, those can be very subjective depending on the patient. So again, if these discussions are not handled appropriately, we can violate beneficence because what we think might benefit them isn't what they think. Um, is a benefit. What we think is doing no harm, they might perceive as the opposite. And what we believe autonomy, giving them autonomy 
may be a different choice than they would have uh, given. For example, in terms of giving information, there might be times when we want to give informed consent. So make sure that we are giving them all the information about their uh, disease process. Some of these patients might prefer to not have that information. Um, and that can kind of go along with like therapeutic privilege. So all of these things are not understood unless there's appropriate establishment and these conversations are had beforehand. So now we marry the two, Hispanics and hospice and palliative care. So again, why is this important? We have 60.6 .6 million Hispanics or Latinx individuals in the United States. They're making 18.4% of the population. This is a significant group. Um, another thing that is important about this is that the Hispanic population is not a monolithic group. They're not all the same. There's many variations in terms of the countries of origin and uh, of the people that make up the Hispanic population, A. And then with, even within those countries and within those origins, there's heterogeneity. So um, in this thesis project specifically, we looked at, to try to narrow down the group, we looked at the largest concentration of countries, uh, the largest uh, representation of countries of origin, which include uh, Mexican origin, Cuban origin, Central American origin, and uh, I'm sorry, Caribbean, uh, of which Cuba is a part, Central American and South American origin. And this is important to even in the way in which we use terminology, because we can confuse, um, for example, like Spaniards who are part of the Spanish speaking population, but maybe not necessarily a significant part of this subgroup. And then people from like Brazil who are part of Latin America, but do not speak Spanish. Those things are important because those two factors of like presence in the country and language are two of the barriers or they influence barriers in which uh, that affect how we're giving this um, care. Another thing that is important to understand is the ignorance of hospice and its associated sources as well as palliative care for this population. Why? Because of cultural differences, these are things that are not seen in these countries of origin. In fact, medicine and the way that it is viewed and practiced is substantially different in other countries. You have um, spiritual and cultural context that is different. And so you have to be able to um, overcome those to then again, inform and educate. Again, moving along with that, you have preference for care and how, and this, and this can be a facilitator actually for uh, Hispanic usage of his, uh, hospice and palliative care because ultimately the goal is to reduce suffering for their family member. And so this is again, important to understand your audience because if you can understand what their primary objective would be and be able to present the information in a way that aligns with that primary objective, it is more likely that they will be amenable to this. Again, discussing this collectivism point, it's this practice or the principle of prioritizing a group or a family versus the specific individual. Again, for us as a very individualistic country and, and the way that we practice medicine, this can seem contradictory. Oh, that's not autonomy but you're wanting to give benefit to your patient. So if that's what they believe, who are we to negate? Um, and features that are important in this collectivism is cohesion and support within that family. Um, that also comes into play because hospice and palliative care involves family caregivers and support of that unit. And so, um, how, we men how I mentioned before in terms of cultural and traditional medicine, this is important because we have to understand the, the kind of basic foundation that these people have in terms of how they view medicine, which will be different. A lot of the times it's cultural and traditional, especially when they are in these countries where a lot of the resources that are available here are not available there. So you have things like Espiritismo, which is a lot of spiritualism and um, the usage of prayers and certain ceremonies in seeking assistance medically to deities. You have traditional medicine where you have um, 
certain terms like huesero, which is somebody that was, hueso is bone, which they would perform massages to treat bones. You have hierberos, which are individuals who use um, specific herbs. Yerba is an herb. And these concoctions were meant to offer healing for whatever, um, like certain remedies. Um, and then this all comes down also as well with medical uh, pluralism. And all of these things, again, are important for us to understand because it can help us to better communicate with them in a way that isn't off offensive nor off-putting to them because we're trying to get them to understand our point of view. So that moves us into barriers. Communication, one of the largest barriers. Uh, one of the main factors associated with this is language. So you have these individuals whose primary language is not English. And if you're trying to communicate and don't even have that commonality, it's very difficult, um, especially when these conversations are difficult just intrinsically. It, it would be difficult to have it with somebody that does share your language. And this also um, is an important factor because we have certain established practices that are trying to address this, but even at times are insufficient. Um, interpretive services or uh, video calls, but if the sole reason that they're being used is because they speak Spanish, that's not enough because we move into the next point, cultural context. Each of these countries, again, uh, producing Hispanic Latinx individuals have different vernacular, different uh, jargon. And so they're along with cultural context. And so communication is, it's important to utilize this in that communication so that it can be effective. You also have the immigrant experience. Uh, apart from them being immigrating here, we also are dealing with many factors such as documentation status, such as um, perhaps the lack of a support system. So they might be one individual whose family is not here. Um, Perhaps it might be their own biases or distrust against the system. Uh, along with this immigrant experience, you have barriers such as access and health disparities uh, teach us about these deserts and where a lot of these concentrations of individuals don't even have a specific uh, place where these kinds of specialties are offered. 85% of the hospitals in the United States are said to offer hospice and palliative care, but that doesn't mean that they are located in a place where these people can access it. And that apart from that, you have finance. Do they have insurance? Um, are they able to pay for this? And uh, not only that, if uh, even if they don't have insurance, the major uh, a significant portion are meeting poverty levels and so obviously aren't able to pay for these treatments. And then another barrier we have is that healthcare staff and that, com that goes along with that component, component of people that are trained appropriately to be able to communicate and offer this care to the specific population. So then how do we intervene and address these? Um, and this is like a multi-level approach we have uh, early and continual implementation of cultural competency and end of life care education. And there are, again, processes and trainings that are in place. Here, here you can read. We um, have multi-levels that need to be addressed to uh, talk about these barriers. So obviously um, the way that this works with bioethics and medicine, if we're you know, um, not being able to offer this, we are violating autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, justice, et cetera. So there's still a lot of research to be done. Um, and that is essentially uh, the research that I have done and hope to continue in the future. Thank you, Nicole. You've given us a lot to think about.